He's just asked me to say that he is a clinical, he's a leader in clinical psychologist and an academic director of the um, East London, University of East London Deakling course. Um, and he's going to talk to us today very kindly about moving from an individual to um, a social vision for clinical psychology. So I'll please give him a very big warm welcome and I'll hand you over to him. into this mic, would that be better? Um, okay, so can, can, can we just get a bit of an idea of who's in the room and how many people are in training to be a social psychologist? Quick share of hands. Okay. <laughs> how, many people, how many people are qualified clinical psychologists? Okay. How many people are trying to get into clinical psychology training? Okay. How many people are not psychologists? Okay, all right, it gives me a bit of a sense of who's in the room. Okay, so, um, so, I'm, so I'm Dave Harper, um, I'm one of the directors, uh, the academic director of the University of London Clinical uh, Programme. Uh, it's really nice to be introduced by somebody from Liverpool, because where I did my training and where I, did, uh, where I worked as a clinical psychologist for about uh, 10 years in the northwest before I moved down here in 2000 to, to work at UEA. Um, I'm really going to talk about just picking up some of the themes from this morning about. We tend to think historically psychology has been quite an individualised <coughs> discipline, a kind of intrapsychic discipline where it looks for the causes and the solutions to things inside people's heads. And what I'm going to say is there's actually quite a broad tradition in, in psychology of approaches that take that obviously take the individual into account but try to place that individual in a social context because the things, the reasons why people become distressed happen in the world outside of them, outside of their heads, uh, and the things that we we need to do. Uh, individual therapy can be helpful, but it's not the only thing that we can do. Uh, and uh, I absolutely agree that psychologists could be more outspoken, could be more getting out there and expressing their views and pointing out to the evidence about the social causes and problems and the need for changes in, in society. Um, but I also think there's something about that psychology also itself needs to change. You know, we don't just want a, a highly professional psychology that's just intrapsychic and just talking about uh, the need to change uh, in times people's minds. If that's the psychology that we're going to do, then I'm not really interested. If we're trying to change psychology as well, then I think and I, I suspect that's why lots of people are in this room today because we do want to change psychology. So it's not only to get psychology more organised, but also to change what psychology uh, is about. Um, so just a quick. Uh, I've been a rather over ambitious and uh, uh, what I'm going to try and cover today. So we'll try and rattle through some of these things. I might just. I'm happy to, if people want to drop me a line or if the organisers want to give the slides, I'm very happy for the slides to, to go out. But this is kind of what I'm going to be covering. Um, so I'm going to start off really talking about the social causes of distress. Uh, quite often in psychology we're, uh, we tend to focus, we, we spend a lot of time criticising biomedical reductionism, uh, which kind of is the idea that people become distressed because of things that are biologically going wrong inside them. The danger is that we might replace that with a psychological reductionism, which says that the other reasons that people become distressed are because of uh, intrapsychic factors, and that's that's yet another reductionism. And we need we need to think about human beings as as both social, psychological, biological, uh, and political. So, what are some of the social causes of distress? Well, this is a, a diagram from the work of David Smell, who, uh, as we heard, sadly died last summer. There's, a, there's actually a conference in November, uh, two-day conference to celebrate. <coughs> Uh, David's work, um, so I advise people who want to find out more to keep, uh, keep an eye open for that. Uh, David Smell talks about there being different influences on why people might become distressed. The, the things that we tend to think about in psychology are these ones at the bottom, the kind of person, and we think about a lot about people's individual experiences and what goes on in people's bodies and in people's minds, and they're obviously important. Uh, if, if we think beyond the kind of individual, we tend to think about that next one up, the proximal influences, so what happens in people's families and personal relationships, they're also important. But we tend not in psychology to think about those kind of distal influences, the ones at the top, the, the society in which we live, the political structures, the ideology and so on, the kind of culture that we live in. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that first of all. What are, what are some of those uh, distal influences? <coughs> So, uh, so this was uh, this morning. This is from the work of uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, who are epidemiologists. They wrote a really influential book called *The Spirit Level*. I'd advise people uh, to read it. There's actually a documentary being released about, uh, but, uh, inspired by *The Spirit Level*. It's called 
uh, the Great Divide. It's going to be at Hackney Picture House on the week on Saturday uh, after the People's Assembly March, which uh, also would have put, su su suggest that I encourage people to go along to. Um, and, and Wilkinson and Pickett really um, do quite a lot of work to suggest that uh, a lot of social and healthcare, physical healthcare and, and, and mental health issues are related to the kinds of inequality that we face in, in society. And this is a very, very crude kind of measure, but on this axis here are the percentage in any country with, uh, with some kind of mental health problem. It's a very, very crude measure. Uh, and along here on the bottom are the countries uh, that vary in, in relation <coughs> to income inequality. Income inequality is different from poverty. Poverty is also a really important distal influence, but actually income inequality is also quite a pernicious form of influence. Income inequality is the gap between the richest and the poorest in society. Uh, and as you can see, the most unequal country in the world is the USA. It has the most, the richest uh, and the poorest, the, the biggest gap between the richest and the poorest in the world. And it's perhaps not a coincidence that that's also the country that has the highest rate of mental health problems. Uh, next in line, this is a great little prize for our country, so the UK is the second most unequal country uh, and, uh, and as you can see there's almost a kind of perfect correlation between income inequality in societies and the amount of mental health problems. Um, and you can see at the bottom here is Japan, quite often the Scandinavian countries on lots of these graphs come out. This is a very well replicated uh, finding. And, uh, yeah, uh, it does suggest that really the biggest kind of health problem that we face in our society is income inequality. If we wanted to do nothing else to change the, the kind of conditions of people's lives in this country, we need to reduce income inequality. Um, this is a, 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 a graph of the uh, percentage of uh, income received by the richest 1% in Britain. Over, um, and this is not a kind of partisan thing, people think this is all down to the Tories, actually this has been going on throughout the 20th century. You can see here that 20% uh, of income was received by the richest 1% in 1918, and we're now heading up, uh, well this is, the last figures were in 2005, but I can tell you this is definitely not getting better, uh, it is if anything getting worse. The 1970s get slagged off quite a bit for all lots of strikes and uh, 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 inflation and so on and so it wasn't uh, great in lots of ways but the one way it was great was the one point in the 20th century that the UK had the lowest amount of money going to the richest 1% in the UK. So when we start to think about changing social policies we need to be thinking about policies which change things like this because these are the backgrounds of the things, these are the things that aren't really within our control in the therapy room, these are the things that we need government, governmental action about. Um, these are the trends in UK income inequality um, over the 20th, over the late 20th century. Um, so this is the uh, this is the the, the, big, the, the rising gap uh, between the richest and the poorest in society. So as you can see under the Thatcher administration, it started to rise. It really rose during the major years, uh, and then it didn't really have any impact through most of the, uh, the period of the New Labour. And as I say, uh, that. That was 2005 to 2006. This isn't getting any better either. So these are the background to the kind of problems that we're facing as a society. And really, one of the things that uh, uh, the groups like Psychologists Against Austerity are going to be talking later on is saying these are the things that we need to do something about. Uh, and, and this is beyond just uh, the current Tory government. This is a, an ongoing problem because at the last general election, all of the major political parties didn't really have any policies that were going to address the things like this. So if we're going to see major changes uh, in relation to the, the welfare system, the NHS, uh, and the people who are looking for help from those services, these are the things that, these are the things that we need to change. So I would say that we absolutely do need to be more organised as psychologists, but we need to be talking about uh, things like this, as well as the things that are just in our interest as a profession, so more psychological therapists. Well, nobody's going to disagree with that, but we need to be saying things that may be perceived to be more political, but they're not party political. These are things that we need to be convincing all political parties about. This thing isn't really working, so I'll just use that. Uh, we know that. Um, Certainly over the last few years with the austerity policies that have been instituted by a number of governments, 
uh, that there's rising debt for most people with mental health problems. We know there's cuts to welfare, we know there are cuts to public services. Uh, and this is a choice by, by particular governments. In, the, uh, in Germany, in the US, um, in Iceland, they opted for dealing with uh, the financial crisis by investing in public services. Whereas in the UK, uh, Ireland, uh, a, number of, uh, uh, a number of other countries, we've gone down the austerity route. And that's a political choice, and that's a choice that's open to people uh, to change. And I think one of the problems of the general election is that we weren't really talking about these kinds of things. New Labour uh, was paranoid about being seen as uh, anti-austerity, but you know, we need to be having a public debate. And I think all of us in this room have a part to play in informing ourselves about things that we may think aren't psychological, but actually if we don't deal with these things, there isn't going to be any psychology. There aren't going to be, we're going to have increasing numbers of problems and decreasing numbers of people uh, to help. <coughs> so those are the, some of the, uh, some of the distal kind of influences on distress. What are some of the, the more proximal ones? Uh, how do those kind of distal things affect uh, individual people? And this is from some work that uh, <coughs> I did with uh, John Crombie a few years ago, where we were looking at how does social inequality kind of impact on, on individuals? Um, some of the things that we pulled out were that uh, people, especially parents, may have less time and ability to bestow upon those around them the compensatory affection, love, and reassurance that might counteract and insulate against the negative feelings their social world inculcates. <coughs> people living in disadvantaged areas are also typically subject to greater threat and insecurity because they're more likely to lose their jobs or become homeless. Social isolation is often greater, and individuals have both fewer opportunities and more restricted choices than those who are wealthier. So it's not to say that wealthy people don't have psychological problems, that would be stupid. They're human beings like everybody else. But if you're poor, uh, 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 and you don't have the resources to kind of insulate yourself against some of those things, then you're going to fare, uh, you're going to fare worse. Relational dynamics, social and material circumstances, interact, each amplifying the toxic, toxic effects of the other. Increased population density, smaller dwellings, greater degrees of social and financial inter interdependency, and limited resource and opportunities <coughs> may mean that the toxic effects of some relational dynamics, like physical and sexual abuse, are felt more keenly. Closer proximity, more shared living space, and fewer opportunities for respite or escape mean that contact with an abuser is likely to be sustained, frequent, prolonged, or intense. So if you think that you're living at home with somebody uh, who's engaged in domestic violence or is abusing you, uh, and you all live in the same room, you've got very, very <coughs> limited room for manoeuvre. You don't have the money to get out of the house, to go to college, to live independently. You're also going to fare, uh, fare worse. I'm just trying to get my uh, clock back here. So how might we kind of, uh, 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 this is maybe especially with, uh, with trainees uh, 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 in the room in mind, where, where clinical psychology is totally obsessed with the notion of formulation, so I thought I'd say something about formulation. Because sometimes people think that the only thing you can have in a formulation are intrapsychic things, uh, cognitive factors. But we also need to think that we need to place people in their, in their social context. So, uh, uh, David Smell did some really interesting work on this a few years ago with Theresa Hagen where they talked about a different kind of formulation, what they called uh, power mapping. Uh, and this is a diagram uh, from their work, which kind of looks at the kind of um, personal resources that we tend to uh, think about as kind of lying inside of people, actually start off life outside of the person. Um, you know, people don't just develop self-esteem, they develop self-esteem because they're treated with love, respect and affection. Um, so these are things that happen outside the person that then kind of get internalised. And so if we want to change things that are happening inside people, we also need to change the things that are happening uh, outside of them. Uh, and so this gives a bit of an idea, I'm kind of racing against time today, but I would just say Google Power Mapping, David Smale, uh, get hold of the paper, it's really interesting uh, approach and way of thinking about, uh, about formulation. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about before just saying you know, how we might do things differently is well, what are some of the problems with the way we're doing things now? Uh, and I think um, one of the problems that's happened over the last few decades has been uh, we live in societies, particularly neoliberal societies, neoliberal is basically just the word for capitalism, uh, we live in the, the societies that are focused on uh, markets, free, uh, free markets. Uh, um, uh, and one of the things about markets is that 
we're looking for kind of technical fixes a lot of the time uh, across a whole range of society. Uh, we're looking for individual technical fixes to things. Uh, and one of the symptoms of this has been an increase in the use of psychiatric medication. Um, now we can blame all this on the pharma industry and psychiatry, but that's really not the whole story. Actually most psychiatric medication is prescribed by GPs, and GPs prescribe medication because people go to them looking for an individual solution. Uh, they want a technical fix because we live in a society that is thinking, you know, if you have a mental health problem that can get fixed in some way. So people are asking for medication. Uh, and part of that is also the pharma industry are in there influencing journalists and uh, ghost writing, uh, read some of David Healy's work to come across some hor horrific examples of ghost writing. Something go David Healy is a psychiatrist in North Wales and uh, did some research and was speaking at a symposium and received, he was being sponsored by a drugs company and the drugs company got in touch with him before his uh, presentation so we've, uh, we know you're very, very busy, we've taken the liberty of writing your paper for you. Uh, and, uh, he, said, uh, he said it was really uh, really worrying because actually they, they've got all of his kind of, you know, writing ticks in there. He said it, re it read like a David Healy paper. But the conclusion in relation to the drug company's product was just slightly more positive than he wanted to put it himself. Now, you know, obviously the farm industry do do those things, but we're living in a society that increasingly looks for individual solutions. Uh, and so we need changes in, in society as a whole. So you can see here on this, uh, this graph, which goes up to the, uh, the early 2000s, that look at that rise in antidepressant drugs. In 10 years, we went from spending £50 million pounds per year on, on uh, antidepressants to £400 million. Pounds. So if we want to move to uh, living within our means as a country, we want to uh, uh, institute austerity policies, why don't we start with reducing the massive amounts of money we're spending on psychiatric medication, which has a whole range of side effects. I'm not saying we shouldn't prescribe medication, but really, do we think that increase in 10 years is absolutely justified in every single case? Uh, I suspect not. Um, and Joe Moncrief and um, uh, her colleague Ilias uh, presented this graph, which takes us up to 2010, so this is 98 to 2010, and this <coughs> rise here, these are antidepressants, so this rise is continuing. So this is a massive ongoing increase in the amount of uh, medication that we're prescribing to people. Do we really think that's a good idea? Do we want to live in this kind of society where we're prescribing this amount of medication? I think not. But we're, uh, we're not totally uh, immune to this as a profession, so this is the rise of number of clinical psychologists um, who primarily these days are on co contracts which are mean that most of our work is individual therapy. So th uh, what I'm trying to say is that this focus on individualised solutions is very much a societal kind of problem in uh, neoliberal economies. That the focus on individual medication is the same as the focus on individual therapy. There's searches for individual technical solutions and also reactive solutions. We're waiting until people have problems and then we give them individual solutions rather than thinking about different kinds of solutions and also trying to get to people uh, and change the conditions of society that are causing these problems in the first place. I'm going to do a Mark Brown every now and again. <laughs> So, what are some of the limitations of individual interventions? Well, uh, what I'm going to say here is absolutely nothing new. Um, and it's got well, uh, um, uh, lots of previous kind of scholars have talked about this. Seymour Saracen, a social psychologist in the U.S., George Olby, who was a, a, a community clinical psychologist in the U.S., sadly died a few years ago. Um, and they, throughout the 70s and 80s, were talking about. Uh, the focus in the US on increasingly individual, particularly biomedical uh, ways of thinking about things and not looking at community and social uh, alternatives. Uh, Keith Humphreys um, uh, picked up this kind of uh, 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 this approach in the 1990s. Actually, Keith Humphreys was Obama's alcohol advisor, not his own personal alcohol advisor, <laughs> but, uh, he was an advisor on alcohol policy. Uh, and in the mid 1990s, he wrote a couple of articles in the American Psychologist that with some quite pithy um, uh, analyses, I think. So the effectiveness of psychotherapy, he says, for most of those who receive it is no longer in doubt, but neither is the fact that psychotherapy can only reach a small portion of society. Psychotherapy lured the field into an overemphasis on individual psychology and individual level treatment as the best approach to society's ills, and an underemphasis under on preventive interventions 
and socio-community level conceptualizations of human behavior. Now this isn't to diss psychological therapy. I've had therapy myself, I found it very helpful. I've also been a therapist for, uh, uh, for uh, lots of people during my uh, yeah, clinical practice, but I think we've got into a situation now where all the, we, we, in the health system we have all these perverse incentives that basically only rewards uh, services for seeing individual clients, bums on seats, and there's really no incentives uh, or even any space for doing different kinds of things, for engaging in preventive work. So if you look at lots of the Department of Health policies, um, Public Health England, there's lots of talk about prevention and public health, but there's very little money with it. And if you get down to the level of commissioners, there's very uh, little incentive from commissioners. So I think one of our jobs as a profession is to change the way commissioners think about mental health, that it's not just about uh, we need more individual therapists. And I think this is, again, one of the problems for our profession, is that often our profession thinks there's mental health problems, what we need are more psychologists. Well, again, it depends what those psychologists are going to do. And maybe we don't need more psychologists, because we've already we've seen the massive increase in the number of psychologists. What we need to do is change the things in society that are leading to the development of mental health problems, in my opinion. Uh, and Jim White, who uh, set up the uh, STEPS project in uh, Glasgow, which is a kind of a slightly different approach to IACTS, which is trying to do a more kind of community engagement approach to mental health. Um, talked about how uh, psychologists are in a market now where there's actually lots of other people, uh, single, single model therapists, for example, CBT therapists, uh, you know, and other approaches. Um, single model therapists can compete uh, quite effectively with clinical psychologists in, in, a, in a whole range of services. So why are we paying, what, 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 why are clinical psychologists worth the money? Well he says psychologists are worth the money as long as we exploit all of our skills, not just the therapeutic ones. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about um, for the rest of um, uh, this morning. Um, what I want to talk a little bit about is the, the uh, 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 kind of public health approach. So not all medical traditions are bad. Uh, and, and a particularly good one in medicine is the public health approach, which is where you take a population <coughs> level look at what's going on in communities and think about what are the general social uh, things that are causing uh, people's problems. So has anybody, anybody heard of Jon Snow? Not the Channel 4 news, we had a bad, uh, a bad uh, episode with dope uh, on the Channel 4 program, but a uh, doctor in the mid-19th century. Um, so uh, if uh, you've been uh, in Soho, this is the, uh, this is the John Snow uh, pub, uh, the Broad Street in, in Soho, and back in the, uh, the 19th century, um, there was a massive cholera outbreak in Soho, uh, and uh, one of the things that you could do if you, were, if you were thinking from a medical point of view, well, let's go out and treat all of those people, and let's think about individual treatments for cholera. But John Snow took a different approach. He thought, why don't we find the source of the cholera outbreak and deal with it at source. And so he did some kind of mapping, uh, and mapped all the cases of cholera, and mapped them over time, and realised that there were kind of a, a circle of, uh, of cholera outbreaks. And he looked in the centre of that circle, and there was this water pump in Broad Street. And he realised that the cholera was spreading from that water pump. So he broke the water pump so that people couldn't get water out of it, and the cholera outbreak uh, um, and dissipated. This is a slightly apocryphal story. If you get into the medical sociology literature, there's all kinds of debate about whether that actually happened and whether that was the root. But anyway, it's a good story. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's quite a telling thing because it does think maybe we think too much about reacting, reacting to problems that are there rather than thinking about what can we do about dealing with the problems at source. So what I would be asking is, what is the psychological equivalent of the water pump in Broad Street? What are the things that we could do at source before that stop the development of psychological problems. So I just leave that thought in, in your mind there. I'll mention another medic. Um, um, this is another medic who's got a pub named after him. I used to live around the corner from this in Liverpool, at Dr. Duncan's pub. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Duncan here, another 19th century um, a medical officer in Liverpool. Um, and one of the problems that they faced in Liverpool at that time uh, were really squalid housing conditions. You would have several families living in basements. There would be all kinds of communicable diseases, very, very high rates of TB. Uh, and once again, Dr. Duncan didn't just go around and think, well, maybe let's just treat, give all these people good healthcare treatment. He thought, we need to do something about housing conditions. 
uh, we need to do something about water supply, access to clear water supply. And so they work with the city council, they laid I think, you know, tens of miles of uh, water pipes, created new sewage uh, systems, were, uh, um, changed the housing situation, built new houses, so got all these poor impoverished families that were living, multiple families in basements, into new housing. So again, what's the psychological equivalent of what Dr. Duncan was doing in the 19th century? What are the kind of infrastructure things? What are the things that we could do in our communities that might try to uh, avoid some of the problems that people are getting uh, in the community? I think one of the things that we could be thinking more about is, is kind of mapping distress. What are the kinds of distress that people are experiencing? Why is it, uh, you know, when we, rather than just uh, receive lots of referrals and just deal with them on an individual basis, why don't we sit down and think, why, are the, why is there this kind of problem going on in this community? What's going on around here? What are the social things that are going on in this community? What's happened uh, around here recently? So, you, you know, certainly in, in, in areas where there are particularly big industries that where there's uh, high unemployment, uh, that could, that's going to be a factor. There may be other things going on in particular communities. And we could be thinking more about trying to change the primary kind of causes of, of, of some of these problems. Um, I think sometimes in mental health we, we really lack ambition. So the most that you'll find people talking about prevention is basically not really primary prevention, it's secondary prevention, uh, where we're trying to spot people who already have had problems and trying to spot them before they get worse. What about trying to spot things before they actually happen? What about trying to change things before they happen? We know, for instance, and this is one example, uh, rates of child sexual abuse, whenever we look at a whole range of mental health problems, we know that child sexual abuse is a massive factor. Where is the national policy to massively reduce child sexual abuse? We don't seem to have that ambition as a society. I mean, probably the Jimmy Savile case has done more to raise public awareness of child sexual abuse than all the mental health professionals in the country. Uh, we need to be thinking more seriously about what would, what would actually need to be in place. And I don't mean more funding for child protection services, I mean changing public consciousness, making it easy for children to, uh, to, 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 to talk about things. How do we equip parents and how do we change the societal kind of messages that we get about parenthood and about bringing up children, about family life. Um, uh, we also need to be thinking much more about working with other agencies. I was at a conference in Liverpool just a couple of days ago and somebody was saying, it's funny, you can kind of work in a city and you're just not aware of all the other organisations that are out there doing things where everybody is in danger of reinventing the wheel. So certainly one of the things that we can do in mental health services is really map out who's around in the community. Uh, I think as Mark was saying before, it's very, very difficult because all the incentives are about us staying in rooms, seeing individual clients, but I think there is something important about teams getting out and just finding out what's going on in the community. I mean, one of the problems that at the moment is local authorities have had their budgets slashed so much that so many of these innovative projects are on a hand-to-mouth basis and really struggling to survive. But maybe that's also th something we can help with, help uh, fundraising for, for all these uh, 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 other uh, charities and so on that are out there. And we also need to be thinking about rather waiting for people to come to us, getting out to where people already are. So workplaces, where are the kind of, uh, think about the local big employers, could we get into workplaces so that we're really trying to help people avoid problems in the first place. Um, think about other educational, social and healthcare uh, providers. <coughs> where, where, where are the psychologists getting involved with city planning? Um, there's a really interesting book a few years ago called Ground Control by Anna Minton and she talks about the way public space has just disappeared now. If you go out into a city centre and you're walking through uh, the city centre, actually very little of that is, is common land now. It's, you know, you walk through these shopping centres, that's, that's all private land uh, with the, you know, they can police who goes in and out there. And there's actually very, very little public space now. And we tend to, especially in, in London, in areas where there are uh, um, uh, big inequalities, what we find is we have these little islands, so, you, know, you think about Tower Hamlets which has uh, one of the most poorest, w w one of the poorest boroughs in the country and also with some of the richest people living there, so you get these little gated communities, uh, so you get an estate and then you get a kind of, you know, one of these fancy new, you know, multi-level kind of apartment blocks with uh, security and then the space outside is this kind of sterile public space with CCTV cameras and it's a kind of paranoia inducing uh, uh, area and that's 
again, a bit of evidence for why inequality is not just bad for, for, for people at the bottom end, it's actually not a good society to live in. I mean, we can see the problems in the US uh, where you have big problems of inequality. Uh, and we have those problems here as well. We, so these are maybe some of the things we need to be thinking more about, about how we change the towns and cities that we live in to make them less toxic, you know, because we're living in a uh, toxic society. Another thing that we might uh, be thinking more about from sort of a public health approach is uh, taking a more proactive approach to research. Um, a lot of epidemiology is very, very dependent in mental health on uh, very, very problematic psychiatric diagnostic categories. So we maybe need to be in there and be thinking about we need to have more psychologically descriptive and more kind of valid and reliable constructs that we're looking at so that we can actually develop services that really meet the needs of communities. We need to be thinking about, as I was saying before, not just being reactive and referral-led, but trying to be more preventative. Um, uh, and we can sometimes feel, oh, it's, you know, it's, 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 too, it's impossible, we can't really do anything about that. But, you know, there's some really good examples of how big social changes happen. You know, we've already talked about uh, Dr. Duncan, there was a massive improvement in water sanitation in the, in the UK in the 19th century. Think about what's happened to smoking levels. Um, smoking is generally <coughs> reduced, and that's not because people were suddenly persuaded that smoking was a bad thing. It was partly because we have laws in place that say you can't smoke indoors, um, uh, you know, in public places, you, you know, and we try to create a different way of thinking about things and people are discouraged and disincentivised from smoking and gradually people think, yeah, I probably should give up, I know I, know I need to give up. Um, so these changes can happen. Even simple things like road traffic accidents. I used to do some teaching where I compared the number of people who died on British roads to the number of people who were killed by people with mental health problems. So, um, anybody have a rough idea about how many people are killed by people with mental health problems in any one year? So, it's around about 10% of the overall homicide rate. So, the overall homicide rate uh, is around about 500, 600 years. So, it's 50 people a year. And quite often you'll see in the radio and TV, um, you know, one person a week killed by somebody with mental health problems. Well, have a guess how many people ki are killed on Britain's roads by cars every year. So, that's, uh, that used to be about 3,500. Uh, so we think that those lives are less important than the people killed by people with mental health problems. Because the, the former is certainly, uh, you know, you, you can do something about uh, a road traffic accidents. You can just uh, reduce the speed limit and speed cameras. Nobody hates speed cameras, but they do actually reduce people's speed. Uh, and and that, that figure's been coming down. So a few years ago, it was 3,500 killed on Britain's roads. It's about 2,500 now. The homicide rate's been coming down over the last few years, like really rapidly. Uh, fewer women are being killed. Uh, and now you would have thought homicides like the weather, you can't really do anything about it. But these are big social problems that are changing. Uh, so it seems to me that mental health things are much more amenable to change than things like homicide and road traffic accidents. So we, I think we could be more positive and more, uh, uh, and more optimistic about um, what we could do. We could be thinking about influencing commissioners to just get away from this uh, two minutes. Shit, right. <laughs> 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 They're going to give me five. I give me five points. Okay. It's a bit more. Okay. Um, I'm just going to. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll just say look up Sue Holland's White City Project. It's a really good model of how you can um, think about doing, uh, offering different kinds of mental health services. Uh, in the White City Project, Sue Holland used to offer 12 sessions of individual psychotherapy followed by group. Uh, approaches and where uh, this is a women's mental health project and women would see an individual therapist for a certain number of sessions and they, they would work in a group to, and they would develop a group understanding because that, that would then often mean that the women found there were common themes in their distress, uh, obviously expert experience of sexual abuse and so on and then that would move into a social action phase uh, where uh, women if they wanted to could, uh, could involve themselves in changing things in their community so lobbying, lobbying the council uh, to change the, uh, the local estate. Um, so there are these kinds of examples out there uh, that give us some hope. Um, I've said some of that already. Um, and just to kind of say, for those who, uh, people who aren't aware, there are actually lots of resources out there now. Um, so uh, Guy Holmes, who uh, uh, kind of developed Sue Holland's work, uh, 
which is a really lovely book, Psychology in the Real World, Community-Based Group Work. Uh, Peter Kinnaman's written recently about the need to move to a public health approach. Um, Jennifer Newton's had a, a book out called Preventing Mental Ill Health. There's books on community psychology, um, Karen Kagan, Mark Burton, uh, Critical Community Psychology, Jim Orford's got a lot of work in that area. Uh, it will be a shame to miss one opportunity to plug a book I'm involved with. 20% uh, <laughs> off Andrews. This includes a chapter by Jackie, who's speaking later on, uh, and uh, a couple of other uh, ex users of, of mental health services. Uh, and it has a lot on kind of social and community uh, approaches as well. Uh, the recent BPS report by Anne Cook. Um, uh, outlines a whole range of different alternatives, uh, including self-help and social uh, uh, social approaches. Um, Lynn Friedman has worked as mentioned before in relation to the work capability assessments, produced a really great um, report on mental health resilience and inequalities uh, for the World Health Organization. Um, uh, and just in case people think this is kind of fringe, radical, lefty kind of stuff, um, Michael Marmot at the UC at UCL produced the uh, uh, Fair Society Healthy Lives report a few years ago, which very, very definitively shows that all kinds of health problems are made worse by uh, inequality. And that actually one of the biggest uh, factors in helping people to change their health is um, have people having more power. Uh, powerlessness basically produces a whole range of of health problems and we could be thinking about whether uh, current and planned government policies will be uh, increasing or decreasing people's feelings of powerlessness. Um, I was going to say, I'm getting a, a, a strong wave from the back, uh, Psychologists Against Austerity is a group that's doing a, a lot of work and uh, I won't say too much because they're going to be speaking later on, but Google Psychologists Against Austerity is a really great briefing document there which outlines some of the um, some of the um, some of the kind of serious problems caused by austerity po um, policies, but also outlines what some of the indicators of a fairer society might be and how we might build uh, a more equal and just and mentally healthy society. All right, thank you. <laughs>